Welcome to the final episode of Series 51, everyone. We are so excited to bring this discussion episode to you. Uh, It has phenomenal fanfic. I'm really excited for everybody to hear it. Uh, (laughs) Before we get there, though, quick announcements because we're trying to keep it brief. Yep. Uh, First up, the game that we are covering the series, Alchemistresses, is now on Kickstarter. Woo! It just launched this last Tuesday, and we are both recommending that you check this game out as soon as possible. We have a link right in our show notes that goes right to the Kickstarter page, and it is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff, like the game, and then if you want the little peripherals, those are an option. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it for any big announcements. You can join us after the show for our final thoughts about the game, uh, our expanded announcements, and some patron thank yous. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, please enjoy this episode, everyone. Our discussion episode. Last time we finished our session zero for Alchemistresses. This episode, we are going to discuss the character creation process. We are thrilled to welcome back Allison K. Cole and Dora D. Rogers, the designers of this game. Do you want to reintroduce yourselves for everyone and then please tell us about the characters that you made? We'd love to. So, hi, I'm once again Allison and I'm a tabletop roleplay designer and uh, founder of Soft Chaos, a workers' cooperative, and I made, well, a past and present version of the Mistress of Air in Alchemistresses. In present day, her name is Sky, and she has a, a friendship with her neighbor River, who definitely she doesn't realize has any sort of crush on her because that would be so strange. Um, <laughs> she's like a flighty artist in a high school. Uh, that is about a thousand years in the future. It's going to be a little weird when we talk about past and present. Now that yep. I yes. Think about yes. it. Uh, so our present day is in the future. So about a thousand years in the future. And then her past self, who is in 2022, is the mistress of air, a kind of superhero-esque uh, magical controller of the elements who's really into Excel spreadsheets and making sure the logistics of their superhero team uh, all stay in, intact. I love that mm-hmm. so much. <laughs> I do. I'm the spreadsheet superhero. <laughs> the stage manager. That's a t-shirt. Like, <laughs> that's, great. that's a t-shirt you give to a project manager. Right. Uh-huh. Spreadsheet superhero. Spreadsheet superhero. Like it's on a coffee mug on your desk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and I'm Dora. Um, I am a game designer and writer. Um, you can find me on Twitter at... Dora D underscore. And I made uh, June in our present world. Um, June is a serious girl who is trying to save money so she can take a trip after she graduates. Um, She's really concerned about falling in her sort of like black sheep sister's footsteps, falling in with a bad crowd. Um, She has a close relationship or a, I should say, a relationship (laughs) <laughs> with Ember. Um, she is Ember's su- ship supervisor. Um, and she's not really sure that Ember is um, millennial times material. Um, <laughs> I forgot that we named it that. How did I forget we that? Did. We work at a oh. diner called Millennial Times uh, and we wear uh-huh. weird <laughs> costumes that are like a really mangled version of like fashion between 1960 and 2030. Um, yeah, what did we say? Low cut bell bottoms, green day shirts, and, and roller ho- skates. Ho- hover roller skates, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Hover roller skates, right? <laughs> oh um, my gosh. Sometimes, though, she yells, blossom into beauty and power, and she transforms into the mistress of Earth, uh, who 
was a um, very like community minded leader um, who was trying to to build up uh, the place around her and had a very close relationship with the mistress of air and tried to get her out of her spreadsheet sometimes so that she could stay like a whole person. <laughs> Amazing. Ryan, please tell us about your magical girl experience. Oh, amazing. Uh, so I, I created River. Um, it, she is uh, in the present day, which is a thousand years in the future. Um, a, effectively a, a swimming jock at the school. Um, she uh, puts her uh, almost everything into swimming. Uh, she really wants to win that state swimming competition in the butterfly category uh, for the first time. Uh, so she's been training hard for that. Um, she's, uh, uh, even though she's a great swimmer, she's very afraid of deep water where you can't see the bottom, um, which I, I personally uh, am, am the same. Uh, you put me <laughs> on the ocean and I will not be anywhere near the edge of that boat. You don't know what's in there. Exactly. I've, I've played Descent into Midnight. Yes, I, right. I know Richard Crate Slandry. <laughs> right, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know what's going on, um, and uh, and uh, she is uh, the mistress of water. Uh, when she transforms, time to get into the deep end is uh, her transformation uh, phrase, and then she turns into the mistress of water. Uh, who in the past, which is our present, uh, 2022, um, she was practically a full-time superhero, um, barely made any time for real-life matters, um, and wasn't able to be there fully for the, the Mistress of Fire uh, because uh, she was being too single-minded with the heroics um, and couldn't reconcile that with her really strong feelings for the Mistress of Fire. So... Uh, and also in, in the present, which is, of course, a thousand years in the future, um, she's got a, a secret crush on the uh, the present version of the Mistress of Air, Sky. It's not complicated at all. Not at all. No. It's my turn. Are we ready? Yes, Amelia. So I made Amelia Antrim, if she were a magical girl. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my character is the uh, past mistress of fire. Um, current day, her name is Ember. Uh, and she just really wants to be the lead in the school play. She does have a job working at Millennial Times, but like it's not really super important. It's just, you know, like she shows up kind of when she feels like it. Um, <laughs> and she is passionate and kind of eccentric. Um, but in her past life as her you know, magical girl self um she was the mistress of fire um and was a sort of politician uh who really wanted to use her passion to like build something that works for everyone um but unfortunately the mistress of water really let her down by not being there for her yeah uh oh, feel bad about that it's one of my <laughs> deepest should. regrets yeah you know, I'm millennial times you. is only you're only going to get out of your millennial times, which you put into millennial times. That's just something to think about. <laughs> Can we talk about how many pieces of flair you have? Right. <laughs> I don't know that your attitude is really millennial times material. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> we need some more turn of the century flair. Uh, I know it's not required, but, you know, Todd has five. I noticed your jeans are a little high waisted. Um, I just needed and your to bell talk bottoms to you aren't about quite that. like wide enough. Yeah, <laughs> it's more of a uh, boot cut, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely see that you're wearing a less than Jake shirt, and it is Green Day. That you're supposed to be. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, that's well, ska reference, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and dive right into a segment we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? So in this segment, we would like to get your thoughts on the character creation process, both in this game and in general when you play games. First, though, 
we're going to ask the world's most cliche RPG podcast question. How did you get into games? <laughs> well, I'm going to give a very impassioned answer by saying it was by starting to play the best game, objectively the best game of all time, um, which is a LARP called Tales of the Crystals uh, for eight-year-old girls. Um, it was designed and written by the person who made the cartoon gem in the holograms. So oh, she's actually wow. a game designer as well. And uh, it is a full-on LARP for young girls. So I started playing when I was eight, started LARPing. You save unicorns, you run through the forest. Uh, I play to this day. Like, I got my friends to go into a forest last summer to play it again. Oh uh, Dee was there. She ended up making out with the evil lady Morphea when no one was around. Um, <laughs> as, I need as to look gun... into this because I have a nine-year-old daughter who's obsessed with unicorns. Uh, would not. I cannot recommend more. Um, it's a little, like, hippie-feely. Like, you do, like, crystal circles and you have a divination board. It's, like, oh, yeah. I love it. Uh, it does come with an audio cassette that plays to give you like a script for your adventure. Um, so yeah, I did that when I was like eight to 10. And then when I was 12 years old, I started hosting murder mysteries at my apartment. I don't know my apartment, my house then, I guess. My parents were very supportive almost every month. So my friends would come in full character costume, stay in character for, for four or five hours, and we would do those murder mysteries. Oh, wow. oh that's so um, cool. Yeah, I went to a performing arts school. I'll say, I'll say that, <laughs> um, which I think is a, a special and unique circumstance. But yeah, so I did that. Uh, so I've been LARPing actually much longer than I've been doing tabletop stuff. So uh, in college, someone was like, want to join a tabletop campaign? And I'm like, it's like LARPing, but without the fun costumes. And they're like, you can still dress up. And then I was in. So <laughs> like it's LARPing, but we sit the whole time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think how nice it would be to sit. Um, I, so I got into, um, I don't know how I originally found it. I was, I was like, I imagine this is kind of a common experience. I was like a teenager who really wanted to try role playing and it didn't had like no idea how to find something to play with, but wasn't at a performing arts school. I was not at a performing <laughs> arts school. Um, I got really into, uh, like vampire, the masquerade, um, back in, in the day, um, and other white wolf mm -hmm. games. That was sort of. That was the first thing I got really into. You know, I think I said I like I like hot tragic girls. So it was like a natural fit. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> and that was kind of when I was a teenager. And um, you know, I did eventually find people to play with and played a lot. And then um, I, you know, was kind of took time off during college and was really playing. And as an adult, um, the the first game that I played that uh, well, a game that I think sort of put me on the path to the kinds of games I love now are it was uh Lady Blackbird. Um oh, yeah. pretty old classic. And yeah, it was I, I don't think I had played in a while and I somehow got involved in a game of Lady Blackbird. And it was uh yeah, it was just sort of a defining experience. And since then, you know, I've I like a lot of what I play and like is like part by the apocalypse, which I think, you know, is sort of in uh in conversation or in an uh, in ancestry with um with Lady Blackbird, so uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind of my my background. It's a, a an intense game to to jump back into the hobby with. Well, it, it isn't. It isn't because it, it. I mean, it it definitely is in a lot of ways. But it, I think that it was relieving, especially coming out of like White Wolf, where everything is very much about you know. There's a lot of storytelling, but it's very much about like lore, and then you always sort of come back to. And form a form a dice pool, and it explodes under these circumstances, but not right. these, and subtracts yeah, the resistance. It's very it, crunchy. Yeah, and then like coming back to Lady Blackbird, which is like a, you know, it's very much sort of like you roll dice. Here's how you make the dice pool, um, and here's like a rough guide to how you interpret any kind of roll, right? Like that was a uh, mechanically. I think it was like a. It was. It felt like it took out a lot of the. Um, the the things that I had found barriers before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it just really, like speeds things up. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. As a fun fact, um, I started games for my graduate degree and there's a indie TTRPG class and Lady Blackbird is the first game you play in that class. So for a lot of people who went through that program, it is the first TTRPG they've ever played, which what I find fascinating. What school did you go to? This sounds amazing. Uh, classic NYU. Like oh, man. I went to the wrong school. 
the it's, fu- it's funny. Amelia and I went to the same school, so <laughs> we did. We did not have a TTRPG class. Not that even I know close. Of. I don't know. Why. No, I I would I looked for any you game design courses. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Maybe Amazing. someday. I'm Maybe. hoping they get a full LARP class because LARP was included in indie TTRPG, which I mean, it's still great. Not a lot of places your homework is playing three LARPs. But like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. Well, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of experience uh, behind both of you. So what do you look for in a system as far as character creation goes? Hmm. Like what sort of pieces need to be there uh, for great characters to happen? Uh, I'm pretty bas- basic. I want there to be... Like the thing I talked about that like fate web of connections is if I'm playing with a group um, and that's most of my play because I think I would have different expectations for a solo game. Mm -hmm. But if I'm playing like a social game, I want dramatic ties to all the other players that have the potential to either explode in my face or become something amazing or both. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really like it when um, room for growth is incorporated narratively into the character, not just like xp growth but my character gets to change and develop and as i when uh the more i as a player figure out about my character the more i can put into them so those mm-hmm. are like two things that are really important to me it was one of my hills to die on is like <laughs> why if we did this dungeon crawl did i gain a skill in sailing at the next level like that doesn't make any sense <laughs> on board yeah. with that the whole time you were walking through the dungeon just thinking, I'd rather be sailing. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had a boat. <laughs> um, so the I really like mechanics that are very fictionally evocative. Um, and so my, my favorite game of all time is probably Monster Arts and like the second mm. edition in particular. Um, where like, you know, you, you look at a, like a Monster Hearts skin and each move just like tells like almost like on its own tells you these very rich stories um one of my favorite like moves in that game is there's a vampire move that lets you hypnotize somebody basically and one of the consequences if it doesn't go perfectly is like their mind comes unhinged which is just like so you read that you're like oh wow okay (laughs) like Mm -hmm. there's so much that can happen coming out of that um i also uh, this isn't the only kind of game I play, but I do. I like games that are very tailored around a specific kind of experience, uh, you know, in favor of uh, as opposed to games that are, you know, that you can tell any story in. Um, the, so, you know, I love Firebrands. I love um, like little authored games. Oh, I just got to play test a great game that is I believe successfully kickstarted soon called uh, I Have the High Ground, which is basically about playing out the the duel. No, 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 let me be very specific. It's about <laughs> playing out the conversation that Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker have before their lightsaber duel in uh, in episode three, <laughs> Revenge of the Sith. Oh right? my gosh. It's specifically about like, you know, you create two duelists who are meeting under some circumstances and then the whole game is just playing out their exchange of taunts before they clash. Um, oh, wow. And you can go in a lot of directions. You know, there's a lot of different emotions that could be that can come out at that moment. But I love games that really focus in on one kind of emotion or one kind of experience like that. Yeah, like I can do this one specific thing really yeah. well, which again, you know, we just finished our D&D episodes too. So this is, you know, no news to our listeners, mm-hmm. but like you can't run everything in fifth edition um, because it just, there are so many games out there that just do all of those little pieces better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that that's, you know, like then you have to find like 800 different games, but like all of these games do different things. And, you know, like mm-hmm. some of them do all like those little conversations or something so so well and i really love um mixing things like that into other games where you're like okay now we're gonna do this downtime scene or like we're gonna have this duel but first yeah you know yeah (laughs) like those little it's the same with like people's dissertations for their doctorates too is like Mm. oh you found this one tiny niche that you are super passionate about and i love that for you yeah like it's so good part of the reason i'm dating dora over here 
is like, I did my master's degree. And one of the first times we met, she's like, yes, I will listen to you passionately talk. My master's thesis was on like intimacy in games. Mm. And she's like, yeah, I would love to listen to you blab about that for Amazing. hours. Free, was like, Great. Free life hack for any listeners, like any, anybody, any grad student, you can make an instant friend for life just be, by saying, like, tell me about your research and then just being patient for half an hour. Like, uh, right? for, like for the last year, I've been joking about making a podcast. Tell me about your thesis and just yes. inviting people on that are that have done a thesis or are doing a thesis to just gush about that topic at me while I just like get my mind Have you mind ever said blown. that out loud to me? Because that is also a podcast that I have wanted to start. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll talk. Okay, <laughs> this is our new side project. Like, Every I've grad student in the world will thinking love you. about that forever. Well, because mine was like I didn't do a master's or anything, but my my capstone in uh, my undergraduate was on um, participation in European Union parliamentary elections. Um, and it's like nobody knows anything about that. But I'm like, let me tell you that in 2010, I predicted Brexit. So. i know yeah yeah well and it's it's funny though that you say that because like you just talked about how you you like games that have you know sort of like that personal connection and and so it's like oh you 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 two work perfectly together it's very sweet (laughs) um so i want to ask how all of this kind of connects with the way character creation works in Alchemistresses. We did see some of that kind of relationship mechanic that you talked about, Allison, about like having those webs between people. Um, How did you bring those things that you love about character creation into this game? So I think a big part for us was this, this memory mechanic. And it was like literally mechanizing the way I play characters too, in a way Mm -hmm. where like, as I learn more about, about them I, there are things I might not know about them and I get very anxious when I'm first creating a character and someone expects me to like know everything about them yes oh, um, I'm, okay like I need room to breathe <laughs> I need room to like figure out who they are and if you ask me to do it on the spot they might be more shallow than I would want them to be um so that's kind of like designed into like how it advances right you learn more about your character you have a page that is blank like it's like a blank page that is waiting to be filled in so that's kind of how that uh, room to grow uh, works. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I really love that. And then anytime I can tie a character to another character in character creation, that's that's my biggest thing for those webs. Um, and letting them know that they'll remember their relationships at different speeds, I think, mm. for this game in particular, is really big into creating those sort of intimate ties and allowing players to arc their narrative. Mm-hmm. I thought that was an interesting option too just because it allows me to play my character at my own speed too yeah because if ryan kind of like discovers memories at a faster speed and i'm like well i'm not there i don't know those things about my character yet like Mm -hmm. i haven't figured out if i'm into that or not um and Mm -hmm. i like that it allows for that sort of like disproportionate level of response to those kinds of things i i really love uh how it in in Character creation in Alchemistresses with the relationship uh, matches is you get two of them. Mm-hmm. And that that first one you might not know fully all about uh, at first. And and it's just fascinating that like as you are progressing through here, those those relationships of the past start bubbling into the present and and how that can like dramatically change how your character views the world. And that it's not the same relationship, too. I like that. I like it when it's messy. I love when things are messy. Absolutely. Yeah. So that asymmetricalness of of the relationships is really sweet, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a like to briefly tell a story from our our current playtest. This is just a great game. And I I could talk about it for a long time, but I won't. But we had like just sort of exactly what you're talking about, Amelia, played out where uh, one character asked asked sort of their past lover like out in the present and was like, hey, you know, like I, we're sort of rediscovering these feelings, like what we should be together. And the other person was like, no, like I don't want to be with you because you're remembering how you used to love a different version of me. And it took like, you know, like so many sessions for that to work out and they eventually did get together, but it was like had to be negotiated and a lot of you know hurt feelings work through before that can happen. 
Yeah, um, like you're remembering a thing that I can't even guarantee happened yeah. at all. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Oh, yeah. so good. That's so good. Also very messy, but it's just, yeah, yes. I agree. It's all, it's all right. I want. That's I, so, it's so fun to play out. Like, it's so, uh, <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, like, I mean, that's a big thing like, from Alchemistress character creation and also gameplay that, that I just love, which is that I just... I, Really, all I want from a game is to make space specifically for, like the 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 drama of my character and their interior emo- emotional state. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm the sort of person who like makes like if I do play D and D, I'm like you know making making the GM take take time to talk about how my night flirting with like the person we met with. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is which is fine, but it's like you know, it's the it's something that that we are bringing to it, right? As opposed mm-hmm. to, I just I really want to be asked like, so who does your character have crush on in, the, in character right. creation? And that yep. like also signals that I'm then I mean, it both signals that that's going to be a part of the gameplay, and it you know it necessitates it being a part of the gameplay because it's it's something on our sheets that we're going to want to keep bringing up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, D wrote a specific session a section called a GM's guide to swoonworthy crushes. Oh, so, that's so good. Uh, very good. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I like the like the actual uh, going through the character creation stuff, the personal goals, the fears, uh, and the regrets. Like the, oh, the regrets. They're such simple, like little questions that that have such complexity behind them that, like in in other games, it's like. Well, especially like PBTA, you're going to be like, you're pick pick from this list of things or mm-hmm. make up your own, and and here's a few relationship questions you can answer one or more of these, but they're very specific pointed questions, right? That yeah. that help tell the story of the playbook that you're trying to go for. These are like so open ended, but like in in such a good way that like you get to define who you are that to a point where like you go through these five or six different fields and now you've got a really decent idea of who this person is and like where they're coming from with their past selves as well. I have uh, to say that I, I usually don't like when things are that open-ended. I have a really hard time um, outside of the podcast making characters for campaigns because I am like, okay, I have to, you know, like I have to get it perfect because I have to play them for a long time. And here there's like no consequences. Uh, But like when you give me an open question like that, it's like, what what do you regret? And it's like, well, I I don't, I don't know. Um, And I don't know if it's just the order that we did things in or like the way that the character creation flows in this game that I didn't have to like really think about it that long it just felt really obvious to me that it was like this is what you you know this is what you care about and this is what you do mm-hmm. and so I think the way everything is kind of built around those things it was like sure I can very easily come up with a sentence like one sentence that will make me cry and you know yep. um it was a lot easier than I expected like looking at the character sheets I was like I'm never gonna be able to fill this in uh <laughs> but I, it wasn't it wasn't as hard as I, I mm. usually find it I think one thing about the structure too is that like, and I guess this, I, I think that you were the one who first brought this up, Allison, is that, you know, it, it makes sense. It makes sense that the game would accommodate this is that th- especially the regret, especially everything for the past self where you, you, you know, that you're sort of, you know, drawing parts of a map and there's a lot missing. It leaves a, like, there's just so much open ended that like you are going to discover answers starting play for a lot of it. Um, and I feel like that relieved that. a lot of the anxiety yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. You're not yeah. supposed to know. You're supposed to like ask an interesting question more. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I think I have a lot of the same anxieties about as you do, Amelia, about character creation, about, like I said, I don't want to know it all right away. And mm-hmm. so as the designer, I think that's ref- reflected really strongly yeah. <laughs> that like a greatest, a deepest regret might not have an answer, but it might have like a hint to the GM about what direction you want to explore yeah, in. Yeah. And then you can get more details, but there's no like direct pressure on you to ever know the answer right away. And yeah, I, I feel I, like what we came up with was evocative, right? Because yeah. it was like, you let me down, but it doesn't t- say like why or how or when mm-hmm. or, you know, like any of the details. It was just like, you weren't there for me. It's yeah. like a Damocles sword hanging right, right over your character. <laughs> exactly. I, I I love the ambiguity of those past questions though too, because it's like, um, do these questions apply to 
one moment in time? Do they apply to the whole lifespan of this elemistress? Uh, uh, El Alchemistress. Uh, I know. Okay, see, I I'm said we're going to be in our own heads because <laughs> like, we got it right the first time. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> this mistress uh, of of the past is like now now that it's open ended, I can kind of decide that. Like, and then you, you're from my understanding when you first transform in the present, you get just those those core thoughts yeah. of what your character used to be and you discover more through play, you're creating these seeds for your uh, future self to kind of discover and nourish and grow into, right? And that's just fascinating that you can say, well, my deepest regret comes from the end of the mistress's life. But this other thing comes from the beginning of their life. And it's like you're, you're getting fragments of this individual and how how interesting and thrilling that'll be to try to discover that through play is is remarkable as a player d described it uh and i, I want to say this lightly because i don't want to like taint what people think it's very like memento like like you would get like a scene and not mm. have the full context for it and then a couple sessions later you would get another scene that would give you context on like that thing you that other thing you had seen in the past yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, like I was, some good like slow burn. <laughs> I was thinking of the uh you know the story I'm thinking of, Allison, from playtesting, where uh I like I was like, thanks, good buddy, to somebody. <laughs> it was so Allison had designed an NPC who was specifically like my tragic The Mistress of Spirit. Yeah, the Mistress of Spirit was in this particular game, my like tragic ex, right? Who and like mm -hmm. our the end of our relationship is part of what broke up the team and like sort of led to a lot of trouble in the past world. Oof. And we gradually learned that. And just like, I just fed right into her plants because <laughs> in the first flashback, I treated that care. I was like, hey, friend, like, thanks so much for the support. Because like, I didn't know. <laughs> and it actually <laughs> created this really compelling narrative of me, like downplaying her feelings after we had her play up. It was really oh amazing. My oh, wow. Oh. That Amazing. hurts to like even listen to. Right? <laughs> like, oh, oh, it's so awkward. She literally like punched the person on the shoulder and was like, "Thanks, bud." Oh like, no! Right after they had broken up. <laughs> Yikes! Oh boy. <sighs> so, how does the process of character creation reinforce the feel of this game and set expectations for play? We've kind of been answering that here. I I feel like there's a lot of pieces missing that I need to discover and it that that hunger for the the missing pieces would easily progress through play. And I think one thing I, I want to mention is it it sets an expectation for the GM too, because mm. as a GM, you have no control. Like during play, mistresses get to narrate their own flashbacks. And so you have no control over them and they can make claims about the world. So there's a lot said about what the relationship between the players and the GM is going to be. Oh. Um, and in the guide, it gives you like, oh, in this episode, maybe tell them a bit, bit about the sidekick. And there's this guide about how to reveal information, what to do. But what you know from that is that as a GM, you are going to be very collaborative and reactive with your style uh, rather than very prepared mm -hmm. uh, in specific ways. And I really like, I like that. I also think it gives the, the players a lot of opportunities to signpost, yes. what do I want to see in this game? Especially mm -hmm. with those questions about like, what do I, you know, like I want to be the lead in the school play. Okay, well, like obviously we have to, like that's going to come up. And you know, even with those questions at the very beginning of like, what things do you really want to have in here? Um, there were a lot of points where we signposted very clearly, this is mm -hmm. what I want to see in the game. So I feel like as a GM, it's, uh, easier to not come in with your like hours and hours and hours of prep because we've already told you what we want to see. Yep. And, and I didn't think like, I'm just, just processing this now revelation. Wow. But I think in the episode <laughs> guide, every episode starts with something that is kind of a bit of character creation uh, addition. So like episode one, the GM asks every character, they have a relationship with an NPC. Do they want it to be an enigma, a crush, a bully or a mentor? And then that's built in. So the start of every episode, there's this like back and forth where you add a little bit to your character and a little bit to the world. 
Mm. Uh, and there's like a very clear guide for the GM to like structure that like a, a season of a, an anime. So yeah. like, you know, Sailor Jupiter has her episode and that happens in the episode guide. And there are questions that the GM reaches out and they're like, how do you want your character to develop? What conflict do you want to be the focus of your episode? So it's very, it's very much that your character continues to develop pretty significantly. And maybe it's the fact that we don't get to play these characters that I always like feel this a little bit, but I have to say that it built up a lot of anticipation of, because there were so many things that we didn't define that it was yeah. like, okay, but like, like I really need to know, yep. you need to know what's going to happen. <laughs> like <laughs> there are so many, you know, like there's so many threads that I, I want to pull on and see where it goes, that it is the kind of character creation that like desperately makes you want to play it out like i am not at all satisfied just <laughs> making the character it's like there's i need to i need to know what happens mm -hmm. i think there's a feeling when you're playing a really good game that has a strong story focus where you are just kind of like like i, I get this all the time i'm just i'm just such a nerd like you know i'll be like uh, i mean this is this i've been talking to allison a lot because she's gming play tests for me i'll just be like oh gosh i can't wait until like here's the thing I want to do as this character. Like, I want to do it, right? And that's true for any, like, great narrative focused game. You're thinking about ways, moves that you want to make to move the story forward, and then you want to find out how that will affect the plot. And yeah. I think it is, like, it's because there are these sort of missing pieces. It's, it's really built into character creation here. Like, you mm -hmm. can't yeah. tell yourself a complete story in your head based off of what you have, and that kind of pulls you forward. Yeah, like I just need a couple more hours of play so that we can, yeah. you know, like maybe that's why you're you're able to do this playtesting campaign thing is because you've left so much. People are like, I have to come back now. Like I have to make the schedule mm -hmm. work. <laughs> There's no choice. <laughs> I think something else in the character creation is like the mix of tones, um, which I think came out pretty nicely in ours that there are one thing I've I've seen just from seeing the game get played um, which is very like, it's very appropriate for Allison's style, <laughs> if you know it, is that there's a combination of like comic and like deeply dramatic elements. They can, they, they juxtapose a lot. Like what my experience through your play is that you go back and forth a lot. Like just mm. very funny shenanigans will happen. And then, um, and then you'll sort of transition into something like very dramatic or like something very mm. thrilling and like adventurous. Um, and I think like the, I think that like, for instance, like, <laughs> the, you know, you have, you have, uh, regrets contrasted with transformation, for instance, right. Which are like, right. please come up with an elemental fun. And it's like, uh, it's a really interesting mix that like the structure of the game encourages a lot because gameplay is always structured around like, okay, let's check in on what's going on in high school. Now let's check in on what's going on with this magical, you know, battle. And I think it, it sort of begins on the character sheets by having those different elements juxtaposed right next to each other. I think that really emulates what, what I know of the genre, <laughs> though, mm -hmm. because I know so many people that like, like, I remember my, my cousin watching like Sailor Moon when we were when we were kids and now like listening to my my sibling talk about it. I'm like, this isn't like my understanding of like what my cousin watched and then like what my sibling watched. Like now that we're adults, I'm like, these are two totally different mm. things. Like you thought it was like funny and cute. And, you know, I'm like, there's like this is heavy. Yeah. <laughs> like There's a lot <laughs> happening in the background that you don't pick up on when yeah. you're, you know, nine yep. or ten. Um, so I feel like it does a good job kind of emulating those elements of the actual genre, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think like the genre and this is true of a lot of anime genres, but definitely of Magical Girls, that there's this like there is the very conscious push and pull, which which we have captured in the episode guide of like the filler episode that, mm -hmm. you know, you'll have an episode where a relationship will really advance, a character will power up and they have to do that by confronting something very dark. And the next time is like, um like we're going Calling on a everyone trip. to work when <laughs> yeah. i'm not supposed to yeah exactly. <laughs> everyone's in bikinis <laughs> no we're playing beach volleyball now uh, yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I have to work this shift and the school play is the same night and now uh, I have to run back and forth between the two. Yeah. <laughs> I have Absolutely. three dates at the same time. Gonna, that was mm -hmm. the next suggestion. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, I also get like like when you were describing the flashbacks and how they're kind of interspersed, 
uh throughout the the gameplay i i my my brain went to uh like the cw arrowverse uh like types of shows where they've got the present day and then they flash back five years and and then like some sort of thing happens back then that kind of also is you know telling of what's going on in the present day that sort of trope uh and and that combined with magical girls is just phenomenal chef kiss chef absolutely kiss. Yeah, we'll go, I'll go into like when we talk about advancement, I'll go, I'll tell you exactly how it works. I think you've like nailed it without even hearing it. It's very <laughs> that we were like, um, Mike, Michael, the other person who designed it and I were like, oh, what other genre would this work for? And we were thinking like, you know, like a criminal minds where they're like looking at a scene and then they have a flashback to how the crime was committed and then it flashes back to the, yeah. the present day. Mm -hmm. Like that's the, yeah, that's exactly like the kind of, of flashbacks that we're picturing for those particular moments. Absolutely. We kind of covered it a little bit just in sort of like our, our descriptive moments. Um, but on this show, we talk a lot about the character sheets and sort of the the intention that was put into designing them. We did some of our stuff in the spreadsheet. Um, but for the actual character sheets for the game, they're lovely, first of all. Um, but what kinds of things did you want to make sure were incorporated in there? How did you decide what things, you know, were were like front and center on there? So. This is, I hope this doesn't sound silly, uh, but my best, one of my best friends of like 20 years is a layout artist. Mm. Um, and so I was working with her and my philosophy for the character sheet was like, if my layout artist friend says it looks too crowded, then there's too much information on the sheet and we should be able to simplify it more and make it more mm. elegant. Mm. So it was about both the mechanics and the sheet. Like it was a kind of like a means testing for uh, what, what looks overwhelming because I know when I look at a sheet and it is very crowded and there are many sheets and it looks very overwhelming, then I am less inclined to even want to engage with it. Yes. Um, so that was like a first, that was a thing that I did um, for that. And I also just wanted it to look girly um, <laughs> and like that. frilly and ma magical and use the most annoyingly decorative font that I could find. <laughs> but um, it looks that, so that, pretty. It was like the like... most annoyingly decorative font that my friend who does design would allow me to yeah, put on right. it. <laughs> it was a negotiation. Absolutely. I love that. Were there certain like elements that you, you felt like needed to be um, like bigger on there or because I know I, I'm the kind of person that like because of my ADHD I'm easily distracted by like ooh okay like this is the first thing I see. Were there, were there things on there that you were like this is what I need you to know right away? So Actually, I will talk about one other thing about the physical design, which is interesting, is that in the game, you only have access to memories that you can see. Mm -hmm. you, you only have access to information you can see, which is why you flip the character sheet. So if you have the mistress side up, that whole sheet is like accessible to you as a player. And then when you flip it over, that sheet is accessible to you as a player. Um, so though it wasn't about prominence, one of the things we had to think about is how to keep persistent information. So like if if my resolve goes down as I'm a mistress, how do I keep that when I flip it over? And uh, the answer is a paperclip. It feels, I feel really genius about it. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of work about, uh, thoughts about that. Um, and that's why the memory sheet is a separate sheet because those memories are accessible to you no matter what state you're in. Mm, um, okay. So that was it. And for visualis uh, <laughs> visualization, I also wanted to just leave, I wanted it to look like you can fill things in, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. I know that a, a portrait, like a drawing a portrait is not, the most mechanically necessary, but I wanted to give that space and give it room to breathe because it it uh, gives you creative ownership over yeah. over the thing. Yeah, it means there's no preconceived notions about what it has to be. Yes. yes. Plus, and well, I have to like explain the um like the paperclip thing for people because we're listening. Um, but there's like <laughs> numbers kind of down the side of the sheet, and so if you put a paperclip on there, it's almost like a little slider that yeah. you could do that when you flip it over, it would be on the same number. Yeah. Yeah, because they they flip from the left side for the mistress sheet and then the the right side uh, for the present sheet, and when you flip the sheet, it if you print it back to back, it, it it's just genius. Stays, Honestly, it's like I love it. That's so smart. Yeah, because uh, when I, you I, first I, like it's something it, I was very proud of. Right? I was like, we're we we've made it. We've made I had a moment. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And um, if you and, back at the right do, Kickstarter level, you'll get special custom-made 
little heart shaped paper clips to track your results. Are you with. serious right now? That's, That's such amazing. a good like like of all the like peripherals. I just like that it's like <laughs> we made special paper like that. Just like I as an office supply nerd, I'm like I well, on the page with you. You've, oh. peaked, you've peaked my interest. I love office um, supplies. And and I do love the uh, the blank portrait as well because like a lot of the magical girl genre is about the appearance of things and yeah. and all that sort of stuff and and having that full creative control to to say this is what I'm thinking for my appearance is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And we often actually don't have people like draw their full selves in until after they've described their first transformation. Because yeah. a lot of people, it's like when they transform from their mundane selves into their magical selves, they really like describing their hair. Oh, and absolutely. so like once they do that, they're like, oh, my hair turns from like blonde to blue and it grows really long and makes like little wave shapes. And so that's like that's uh, it's again in the episode guide for the GM with specific prompts, like make them physically describe their mundane and magical self as they transform. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. I didn't so even good. think about my hair. Same. Oh, I mean, it's like a real missed opportunity. Yeah, you can't you can't do it all every session. I know. Yeah. Well, we got fanfic. It's fine. That's, we'll get there. <laughs> uh, before we get to that, um, what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in this system? And what is your favorite part? Oh, I only prepare for the flaw, not the favorite part. Uh, so- <laughs> so the like I I like I have strong feelings right because they have the things that we've struggled with the most, and the number one that we mentioned is the order in which character creation goes. Yes, and how that flow happens. Um, I think it's very hard. It's not only hard for us to know, but it's hard for people to know ahead of time which one will work the best for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think figuring that out has been a challenge, and spells used to be really bad, like really bad. Uh, like. I want to give all the props that I can to Shrong because uh, bringing in that, like helping people with that construct guide has Mm -hmm. been really useful. But I think one of the weaknesses is that people, it takes time to get into how to use your spells. Like, I think it would take, do you can, like, let me see what you think, because you've seen as many games played. But I think it takes a session or two for you to kind of truly, like, fall into a good groove. And ideally, like my dream is that that would be right off the bat. You would have a strong idea of the spell. But I've seen people have to take some time to like get into them. People who have seen Avatar more quickly than people who have not will be (laughs) like. I don't know that I've ever played a game, though, where like the magic system was like Mm. right away. Like it always. And I love playing magic users. But like for some reason, I, I don't know what it is about magic, but like almost every game that I've played or read has like taken me a minute just to like I have to do it a couple times before I know. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that that's something that's um unique to your design experience at all. It- Honestly, as someone who does like who has a focus on intimate design and narrative, combat design was like new for me in this and it was really mm-hmm. eye-opening to to work through. And sorry I interrupted you Dora. Go ahead. I was just about to say that the I think it's not a weakness per se, but a challenge of The character creation is just that, like, because you're creating two characters and two worlds, it is just, it's a lot to move through. Um, Yeah. So we've thought about that in terms, we've thought about that a few ways, right? So first of all, I think that, like, you know, we were sort of commenting that it it doesn't feel as long as it necessarily is. It also, like, the structure of how you build things makes the sort of subsequent steps feel feel easy. So a lot of it is built into that. And then I, I think we also, you know, try to address that um for to to deal with it and how like we structure first sessions so um the first sort of like the, the first episode of the anime season is intended to be played over two sessions um and like that in sort of the gm guide there's very specific milestones for like what you should aim to get done in the first session you know with it alongside the character creation to slowly introduce the world and the situation and then give room to complete that in like a second session. Okay, um, to kind of like to be ease con- people into it or like give you time to, okay. Yeah. yeah, there's a, it's like 
episode one, part one, and then it ends on a to be continued. Right. Dot, well, dot, dot. it starts Love with, it. you know, it starts with Usagi like running down the street to catch her bus with toast in her mouth. And then like yes. <laughs> only only at the right time does Luna say like, Usagi, you're the so I think I'm actually doing the American dub voice, which I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure everybody could tell. Everybody was like, "That's a perfect Luna from the American dub." <laughs> um, but the original American dub. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So there's there's a specific pace into it. Okay, so it's time for our favorite segment. What is our fanfic? So I feel like over the course of this, we've had several questions that we're like we will answer that when we get there i do know we talked at the beginning about like subs and dubs and we did not make a decision on that Mm. so i feel like that might be the place to start gosh it almost has to be a dub because of the 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 zaniness of uh the millennial times um (sighs) And, and then it's like bad translations of cult, like it was made in Japan, but then like, so it's a Japanese filter of American culture filtered back through a dub. Yeah. Interesting. See, the I, layers. so like personally, I like dubs just because I have a hard, like I have executive processing issues. So like, I can't, like, I need to both hear it and see it. So like, I I watch American shows with subtitles on, like I have to. So like, that's where my, I'm just like, I has to be a dub. It has to. It's, um, you know, it's <laughs> but that's not for any like story reason. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like, we don't need to get into sub dub discourse, but like, the, <laughs> Too late. There, no. there is like a specific cultural history to it. Because I think that like what, like, it, if you're well, the, definitely the thing that comes to mind for me, like being the exact age I am and like having the cultural exposure that I did is that like, if you ask, is it the sub or the dub? What you're asking is like, is it sort of like the, because in the 1990s when anime was first coming to North America, like dubs were just like, yeah, everything was dubbed and it was all really weirdly bad. <laughs> like, right. you know, it's like famously, um, you know, the, like one of the most like touching, uh, like, you know, queer romances and youth culture was changed to them being cousins um, yep. in the original yep. Sailor Moon dub. Even so, I know that. Yeah. Yep. So it's like there's sort of this like the there's an association with like the sort of like low quality and kind of like zaniness and fractured storytelling, which is not actually mm-hmm. fair to the process of dubbing, which is like a completely valid process that makes a lot of work more accessible right. to a lot of people. Yeah. So it's a yeah. complex, what do we talk about when we talk about dubbing? Right. Is like, the what question do we I mean? want to ask and, you. Well, and then I think there's a level of like sometimes like yeah. gatekeeping involved with that. It's like, oh, you just watched the one that they showed on Saturday mornings yeah. and I went and found the other, you know, like yeah, yeah, I yeah. put more effort into it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely um, like a like watching the dubs is a valid cultural experience and it's okay to like love love them with all of their quirks and also mm-hmm. like you know especially as time moves on like there are very high quality dubs of a lot of things available including Taylor Mute now mm-hmm. yeah yeah we've definitely like gotten better about that and I think um as as time goes on to like more culturally sensitive in those things yes. too mm-hmm. um which is good which is good absolutely okay so uh, here's a question what are we all wearing to prom <laughs> Uh, I, this I do, is important. I do want to know, but I'll do you one better, which is what are we wearing to prom and who do we go? Who with? are we taking? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. See, and I wasn't sure, like, are we taking each other or is it like NPCs that we haven't met yet? You know? Well, I, I think River and Sky are going just as friends, of course, because they've been right. just friends their whole of life. Of course. Yeah. Why wouldn't oh, they? But, but at this point in the in the series, I would have found out that. I, I had feelings <gasps> for the Mistress of Fire as well. Oh, that's true. Because um, prom so, is going to be at the end of the season. Yeah. So now I'm now I'm torn. Uh, like it, I've got these two secret loves that, and it's and I know it's eating away at my past self to not put those forward into the world and to focus on my thing. And here I am focusing on my swimming again. Yeah. And, and am I going to miss out on this chance for love? Oh, I like it a lot. Oh. But so, and then, then my question too is like, is Sky even the kind of person that like goes to prom or are you the kind of person that's like, I'm too cool for that? Oh, I actually, you're right. There could be a too cool, um, not to tell on myself as a human, <laughs> but I only went because someone, 
uh, forfeited their ticket and they were like uh, PJs over slacks and sneakers under a fancy ball gown dress. I didn't skirt. go because I couldn't be bothered. It was it was expensive and stupid. Agreed. <laughs> and then uh, everyone else went to an after party and me and my two friends went home to watch The Last Unicorn. So. Oh. I think we watched Fight Club. Um, but that's, yeah, I think that might be a, like, Sky would be there if there happened to be a free ticket around and would be wearing something quirky that's definitely not prom appropriate. I'm only gonna... going because I didn't have anything better to do tonight. Did you, did, did Sky ask anybody to prom? Obviously not, I guess. No. Did anybody Gosh, ask no. Sky? I don't, I mean, I mean, Rivers I guess it's with... a question mark. Oh. Like, it, yeah. it all depends on River. I think River probably would have. But like, like, hey, I don't, I don't have anybody to go with. It I, was I your spare ticket. Yeah. So like, you know, hey, do you wanna, do you wanna oh come with, uh, with me? And then like, super awkward about it. But like, don't worry about it if you don't want to. Whatever. Um. Oh, so I then, entirely up to Sky, if she goes with River, because in my mind, if not, I would probably ask out, um, Ember, at that point. Mm -hmm. So how do we feel about Ember's like where where's Ember memory wise at this point? Like what mem like what memories of the mm. past like this is probably it's gotta be late in the, the campaign, right? So yeah. we've all uncovered a lot of memories, <gasps> oh, but Ember could be yes. missing key context. Or, or could know extra things. Could have had bad memories instead of good ones, right? Yeah. That would have right. like to or, Well, because or, like, what I remember right? is that you let me down. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, you know, I think there's, like, this, like, sort of, like, part in the back of my head. It's like, you're not even going to show up. Like, why would you, you know, why would you not let me down again this time? Like, I'll, no. Right. Oh, I like this. Uh, so, no. Sky, I want to go, go, and I'm going to look yeah. super hot just to make you jealous. Yes, yes. Like, there's a whole scene, um. like, there's a whole makeover <laughs> scene about, like, we're going to, like, pretty woman this and, like, look super amazing just to, like... Okay, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. June gives you a makeover because June knows very little about, like, being femme, but she's remembered a lot from her <gasps> past life. Right, from your other oh. part, like, yes. Oh, my gosh. And you're like, I can do it. And I'm like, okay, look, you? Like, yeah. yes. Uh, and what? What, what it's like um, right after work like in the back room of millennial times yes like we gotta get quick yes. we have to like oh. quick get ready and you walk out of the like you know like we've seen this set like a ton and it's always sort of like fluorescent lights and it's like everybody like it's always the two of us like me looking harried and you looking bored and you walk out mm -hmm. and you just look <laughs> yes yeah amazing and who's the baddie who's trying to ruin our prom uh that would be my date <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh yeah so uh i mean it, i'm just allison i'm just for purposes of convenience i'm gonna go fully to type which is that um june is uh like is not dating but is like pointedly not dating the alter ego of the mistress of spirit the villain who's been bedeviling us this entire time and um i I go like stag to prom and I'm like hanging out with everybody like ah, ha, ha, this is so fun but then there's a scene where I walk out like onto the like the you know the whatever the gym like the, the place outside of the school and um I just like sigh mournfully and then out of the darkness walks the mistress of spirit in like a gorgeous dress and I'm just like oh and then she's like come with me you don't have to be a part of what happens next but I walk away. Oh, Don't worry, no. I'll stand at the team. I would never betray you all. Uh, no, <laughs> you say that. <laughs> I know. I don't. I, I don't trust this one either. Oh, this is very no. two type. These favorite mm -hmm. characters go off and make out with the villains, and then are untrustworthy for the rest of anything. Uh -huh. I, am, I am very trustworthy after I make out with the villains. I'll have you know every time. <laughs> So I want to know, I assume that June is, like, wearing a tux. I feel like you have, like, very, like, Janelle Monet, like, you know, like, feminine, yeah. but, like, I think you you're. Know. I think you're exactly right. I think that the effect of, like, uh, th there's, you know, just sort of, like, a background plot the whole time of June being, like, am I the, like, super glamorous mistress of Earth, or am I 
this kind of like, you know, down home, comfortable, practical June. And I think that I think that the right solution to that is that she shows up to prom in a tux looking like incredible, mm. just, yeah. just spot on. Mm -hmm. I am going to say that River like normally dresses um, like with her hair up and like, you know, pretty proper uh, for school and all that stuff. But then like when it comes to prom, she does that whole like let your hair down and somehow oh. you're like a hundred times more attractive. You take off the glasses. And take and off the like, glasses. Now yep. you wear contacts. <laughs> yep. And uh and, and like I've got that like Disney princess gown going. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And like so like pretty much going all out for this event, even though she's not even sure if she has a date, but uh she she wants to put herself out there to try to experience this to see if 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 she can actually get a hold of love instead of having it slip between her fingers all the time yeah oh. and i think this might be like so part of what i would i would do with this character if i was playing it over a season is reconciling with the practical past self with the totally oblivious present self mm -hmm. and while we're getting to the end of the season this might be sky's time to like realize uh some of the not so subtle hints River has been leaving uh, over the course of the season. And they, uh -huh. I think they would have a moment uh, in this episode. This guy's like, wait a minute. And then there's like a comedic anime flashback to like every single moment where like. All, all the times I brought you like little baked goods just for all those, fun. Like, almost, oh, I'm trying this new yeah. recipe. Oh, here's this fun thing here. Like you this... bring a Valentine. Yep. Just like, like that, that, that little montage happens. I imagine River too being like, "Oh, it's fine. Like I'm giving Valentine's to everybody. Like don't you know worry about." But like, it's, you just made the one. Yep. <laughs> so Absolutely. Good. That's so good. Oh. Yeah, Our, I think we've talked about the most important things. I agree. Um, I did find out the one thing that we said we needed to do. Mm. Our final spell. Oh, <gasps> oh that's right. Oh. That would happen. So in this scenario, we would possibly be battling the mistress of spirit as like a final big bad at the end of the season. And we would all have to combine our powers uh, to create a final spell and it would cost us all something dramatic. Uh, oh. And this is kind of inspired by, you know, the uh, very traditional end of Sailor Moon season one mm. where they do that final spell. And then at the start of season two, they had lost their memories. Oh, right. okay. Yes, yes. So it's very much like we can confront this evil and we have this powerful tool to defeat it, but dot, dot, dot. Oh, boy. What if it is, what if the thing that we lose is the ability to transform afterwards? Either way, actually, it could work that we're stuck as magical girls or that we're stuck as humans. <gasps> That's so good. That would be yeah. fascinating either way. Mm-hmm. Because, like, if 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 this is the final confrontation and we're we're stuck without our transformations again that's fine because now we can live life as normal but you know there's always that well what if something yeah. comes along and now you've got that worry right what if season 2 right exactly <laughs> right. season 2 is going to happen of course because this sounds phenomenal and it's going to get renewed yeah, but sure. also like you know that's a lot of tension to to live with you know you've right. had all yeah. this power and ability and now you don't but yeah, then, i think there's like, like a level of relief of like okay i don't have that responsibility either i but, love yeah. that but I think on, that's the, great. on the flip side stuck as your transformed selves now you're a hundred percent yeah this mistress in the present as well mm -hmm. so i and, think the thing is we write two different episodes and then if we get renewed <laughs> then we get stuck in our old selves. And if we don't get renewed, it can be like the nice ending of like, okay, yeah. we, we defeated the evil. Like we don't need to, now we can just go on with high school. You know? What if it's but a even the getting what if trapped a, in the, oh, sorry. What if it's a coin flip for each of the characters? Oh. <gasps> like or, some might get stuck, might not. Or not a coin flip, but an individual choice that they have to make alone. Oh, no. I like that. And there's like the the sacrifice of staying as your old self is you're like giving up your present day identity. Right. You're mm -hmm. essentially like the person you are or have been your whole life no longer exists. And you are just a reincarnation of that other person. 
See, oh. and then I pick to be in the pa- be my past self, but like River stays as River, and that's the moment that you like let me down because now I'm stuck here and you're not here. It's like a re a re yeah yes. yeah oh yeah no oh. love it. Uh, I oh think. My God. Uh wow. It would depend what Sky learned over the course of a season. Right. Yeah. At the beginning, she definitely would not ever pick being a spreadsheet superhero. For sure. <laughs> She's like, this is everything I hate. Um, but I think she might like to go against type. What I would want to do is build the season so that at the end that decision made sense. Yeah. So there was enough growth that like staying being the person who took care of the things is the choice she keeps yeah yeah mm-hmm. but even even just having that decision over your head like knowing that if you use this that decision will come to fruition like yeah. that that's enough to not want to use it unless you absolutely have to yeah because that's that's a huge life-altering decision yeah oh my god yeah oh i think and then the season ends on like this sort of epilogue shot of um it's in millennial times we see like mortal June surveying River, um, like maybe maybe River sitting at the at the window booth. June comes over and and puts down her fries, and then looks up and like and River's like what? And we both look outside and like standing on a building across the street, we see the two magical girls like their capes flowing oh, yeah. behind them in the wind. <laughs> And there's just like a long look exchange and then you disappear. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, heartbreaking. That's so good. How can we get us all back together again? Season only season two will tell. I Don't know. Have... Well, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> oh. Which means it's time so for good. our next segment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've hinted at it a lot, um, but let's go ahead and talk about advancement in this game and how that works. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Yes. Yes. So there, which is interesting, is there some advancement that's tied specifically to the episode guide? So that's like, um, we were talking about each magical girl gets their own episode. Mm-hmm. And once you do that, you get some uh, mechanical advancements. Uh, like you get you get your second spell through that episode, not Ooh. through any other traditional means. So that's one way characters advance. And the other is literally through those memories you get. Mm. So there are two types. Uh, there are those team memories. And those are full flashback scenes that happen every episode. You'll get one big team flashback that usually happens right after you defeat a baddie, you know. Um, but as individuals, every time you take an action as a mistress, that involves doing a check, you roll a special die called the memory die. Um, I did spirit fingers. I think I'm learning. (laughs) Um, And on either the highest or the lowest number of that die, you will get a memory. Uh, And the highest number will be a positive memory. And the lowest number will be a negative memory. Oh. Uh, So it starts on a D6. So if you're in kind of like if you're fighting or anything you're doing as a magical girl, you roll a D6. If you don't get a memory, it downgrades to a D4. And then after that, it's a coin flip. So you'll always uh, relatively quickly be getting these memories. Mm -hmm. And they're quick flashbacks, kind of like you were talking about. So if I'm like fighting a bad guy and maybe I hit them with a lightning bolt and I roll my memory die and I get a memory, that moment, that interaction flashes me back really quickly to the past. And I see something from the past that is now matted to my memory sheet. Um, So the advancement is first and foremost narrative. You get these memories. So there are mechanical benefits to um, those me- memories are not on your magical girl side of the character sheet. So you can use them when you're not transformed. And there's like a whole like alchemy points. We kind of I think I briefly mentioned, but they're just a resource that you use and you can use them to call on any of your memories to make your roles stronger. Oh. So if in that memory, I remember hitting someone in the face with a lightning bolt. Uh, and then in my mundane self, I'm doing something. And I think that skill would be useful. I can then call on the memory to make it better. Oh, cool. Um, Very nice. I like so that those, a lot. those are always available to you. And then every second or third memory, uh, if you can see, do you have the memory sheet? Or if you can see, there's like little icons on it. Um, and each of those icons is a special thing. So every second or third memory, you get another advancement. 
Um, and sometimes the plus ones are just they are increasing your stats only when you're transformed as a magical girl. Mm -hmm. But other things you get, uh, you get a magical item that is like Sailor Moon's transformation pen. Oh, nice. So you get a memory where you get an item and that can be used uh, to like give you benefits in combat. The last memory you get, you remember your name from the past life. Uh, and when that happens, you get to bleed one of your convictions from your past life to your present character. Um, and it now is uh, able to be referenced as a mund in your mundane life. Oh, nice. Um, so the, like, main, the main advancement uh, is all narrative. It's all about these memories, about figuring out who you are. And then they're structured to be tied to these mechanical things that we think are very evocative of the magical girl genre. Mm -hmm. um d please tell us about your your item d has the best item well it was or not the best item the best motivation for having an item <laughs> it was um oh gosh where do i even start so i i i pretty much got sailor moon's transformation pen so for anybody who doesn't know it's just sort of you can do this sort of simple disguise um to look like something she really never uses it for anything effective mm. <laughs> I think she literally is like, I need to, I need to get these people to safety. I'm gonna make myself look like a stewardess because people trust flight attendant. Like it was, it's all, uh, you know, it's it's Usagi. She's doing her best. Yeah. But um, the so I I got I got such an item and I used it because I uh had <laughs> like oh gosh where do I even start? So we I had encountered my evil ex from a past life in her mortal self, but I didn't realize they were the same person. And uh, in order to, like, I, I you know, I didn't think that she would date me. So I disguised myself as my own cool older cousin to flirt with her. <laughs> Ryan was my cool older cousin. She was really, really hip. <laughs> Amazing. So that's you too. <laughs> you get a magical item to flirt with a girl if you. Because it was a student want. placement teacher and she was a senior in high school. It wasn't school. appropriate. Oh. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, so good. Well, uh, before we head out, is there anything else uh, either of you want to say about Alchemistress's uh, uh, fi final remarks? Uh, Any last we words? Head out? No, I'm <laughs> wow. Uh, I just wanted to say it was, it's was—it's been wonderful to talk about it with someone who is so passionate about the genre and also like the weird quirks that are specific to this game, like the genre bending and the like uh, specific like double world creation and the reincarnation and the social dramas. Yeah, I Thank feel like you. you Googled like, who is the person I should talk to most? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, and I'm really I'm really thankful we had the opportunity to do this because, uh, goodness gracious, this was uh, an absolute delight. Does your face hurt from smiling so much now? It, like... it does. It has <laughs> it has some like uh, cheek fatigue. Uh, <laughs> Please so. never use those words again. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> cheek well, fatigue. <laughs> Alice and Dora, thank you both so much for joining us to talk about Alchemistresses. Thank you it's for having been us. An absolute like, yeah, pleasure. it's been wonderful. <laughs> can you remind everyone where they can find you online and what sort of things you're working on? So, uh, number one, look up Alchemistresses on Kickstarter. Uh, it's funding now, I'm guessing, and we're very excited about it. Uh, you can find me, Allison K. Cole, on Twitter or softchaos.games on the internet. And you can find me on Twitter at Dora D underscore, or uh, you can see some of my work at dcity.itch.io. Well, thank you guys both for sitting down with us. This was so much fun. Mm -hmm. I am sure that by now, by the time this episode comes out, you've already fully funded at like 400%. It's Heck yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> but thank you for doing this. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Call to action. Yeah, like that. Okay, Ryan. Yeah. It has now been, what, three <laughs> week, four weeks ish since we recorded this. I don't. I don't even know anymore. I'm not sure. Was it the twenty? I think it was the twenty second of May. Maybe. Uh, um. Yeah. 
So yeah, just like three or four weeks. Yeah. How are you doing? Still. Have you um, recovered? I, I mean, it still is occupying a large portion of my RPG brain. Yeah. Um, it it probably is currently my favorite like four player RPG uh, mm-hmm. that I haven't played yet, especially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's so my favorite four player <laughs> RPG that I have not played. Um, right. I mean, it, it's it it's fantastic all around. I, I'm very curious how it would play with fewer than four or or even more than four players. Um, yeah. But like, goodness gracious, this game just has everything I would want for a magical girl game. And uh, I, I think that came through with my exuberance during these recordings. Definitely. Yeah. It, it's also, I think, the fastest you've edited a series ever. <laughs> like, just get it. Get yeah. I got to get it. Like, I want it uh, all out in the world. I know. Um, oh, it was so good. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. This is a mm-hmm. lot of fun. Absolutely. You can check out the Kickstarter if you liked what you heard, which I hope you did, because uh, it was great. Mm-hmm. I don't know why you wouldn't like it. Um, <laughs> they launched today as of this recording, but it will be last week by the time you hear this. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have made insert amount of money so far, um, <laughs> and they will need to make certain amount of money more to achieve their goal or they have achieved their goal (laughs) (laughs) you can put like a little robot voice over that (laughs) um i for one am thoroughly looking forward to all kinds of stuff here like the peripherals and the like i just did the soft cover but the stickers i did the stickers too yeah i Um, want that hardcover so bad yeah the hardcover stretch goal oh my goodness Um, but they need our help getting there or don't need our help getting there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it will all be good by the time this comes out um, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I'm, I'm really excited for this campaign and goodness gracious. Uh, if you, if you can give uh, to, to at least back at the PDF level, if not higher, uh, this game uh, is, is just something special. So um, absolutely check it out. And, Oh, pl- please, please let me have the hardcover version of this game, everyone. So. <laughs> right. Seriously, please, everyone, let Ryan have just this one thing. Yep. If I ask you anything this year, it's back this Kickstarter so I can have a very much cooler version of this game. Right. Awesome. Well, uh, we are still uploading episodes to our YouTube page. Uh, it's a slow process, but it's going well so far. Uh, if you have a moment, uh, go ahead and subscribe to our channel at youtube.charactercreationcast.com and uh, maybe even like some of your favorite episodes. I think that'll help us out, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some sort of algorithms. Yeah, they look nice, and I'm organizing them into playlists, too. So um, if you want to go through and listen to, you know, all the PBTA episodes or just the indie games which is actually a really hard category to define um yeah. just the ones where we had designers something like that um youtube is really nice for that because they're all organized that oh, way yeah. as i get them uploaded obviously i think mm-hmm. as of this recording i have up through 39 so 39 to 51 in yes there. um slow and steady wins the race Work, working backwards uh and and like and subscribe to, to help the youtube ghosts yeah uh give us give us recommendations to other people Right, because that is also how YouTube works, because they are part of Google. So it is yep. just ghosts um, and ghosts, just ghosts love when you both like and subscribe. That's very true. As everyone knows. <laughs> uh, next up, check out what we have to offer on our Patreon page. Our last episode of June will be the final Q&A episode that we didn't have room for last month because y'all mm-hmm. asked so many questions. Yeah. Um, but that Q&A episode is already in our Patreon feed. So if you back at the $5 and up level, you can get access to that right away. Mm. Um, if everything goes smoothly, the week we are recording this cold open, the first episode of series 52 should be in there as well. That one was so much fun so to much record. Fun. That was yeah. like, if Alchemist this was Ryan's jam, I don't know. I guess I don't want to say that this was like the most my jam, um, but it was it was a lot. It was a lot. Your jam. It was a yeah. lot me. I was pretty Absolutely. excited about it. Absolutely. Um, so 
don't forget too that every tier provides Discord benefits, so you can get access to extra Discord channels. I know we've had a few people back the Patreon, but they're not on Discord or haven't joined our Discord. So uh, this message is for you if you want to. Uh, feel free. Uh, mm-hmm. You can li- link your Discord to Patreon to get access to those exclusive channels. Or if you join our Discord at discord.charactercreationcast.com and just let us know, we can give you the role too. Mm-hmm. If you don't want to link them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of our patrons, uh, we have some special thanks to our current backers as of the time of this recording. Uh, first, we want to thank our new backers since the last recording that we haven't been able to thank yet. Mm-hmm. So, M- Matt Newton, thank you so much. Uh, Daryl Holiday II, thank you as well. Mm-hmm. And of course, we want to continue to thank our existing patrons. Uh, Lieutenant, our first patron, thank you so much. Eric Bonds, thank you so much for your support. And David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, thank you so much. And thank you to any and all future patrons. Uh, Your assistance helps us produce the show and keep up the quality of the things that we're doing here um, by covering all of the costs to make it. So you can head over to patreon.com slash character creation cast in order to support our show directly. Um, Every little bit helps. And we are very thankful to everyone who has contributed and can in the future. Also Mm -hmm. to let you know, I just finished designing the thank you notes for the $5 and up backers. So um, if you want one of my lovely handmade thank you notes, um, and now would be an excellent time when I get the first round sent out. They are gorgeous, and I guarantee they are worth it. So definitely yeah. check that out. Goodness. <laughs> I want one now. Well, I can send you one. If you would like one, I will mail you one. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, send one, I'll send you a special co-host thank you card. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> then I'll send you one back with just stick figures on it because right. I can't do anything hard. <laughs> And with that, uh, we don't have any more announcements since we are out of reviews. Um, If you want to help us there, feel free to check out the show notes on where you can leave reviews, and we will read them out on the show during this segment. But in the meantime, thanks for joining us, everyone. We hope you enjoyed our Alchemistresses series. Stay tuned next week for our final Q&A episode. But until then, take care, stay safe, drink some water, relax a bit, And keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by the absolutely fantastic Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game system used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much, much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time.
now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Campaign. Campaign Skyjacks takes place in an original setting inspired by folktales and classic adventure fiction. James D'Amato leads Liz Anderson, John Patrick Cohen, Tyler Davis, Johnny O'Mara, and in recent episodes, Nathan Blades, as they tell a tale of daring sky pirates, giant birds, and the terror of a cursed sea. It's funny, dramatic, and at times emotionally devastating. Search for Campaign, Skyjacks, or James D'Amato on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. Yay! Got it. There we go. The first pressure moment through. I know. <laughs> I know. High stakes. Off to a good start. It is. It, I have to mention this just because it's my favorite fact. Um, but D usually ends up playing Earth because it's always the last one chosen, actually. Uh, but in the campaign we're running now, like the person who picked Earth is the most Earth person I've ever met. And she like, <laughs> this is the player, not the character, but the player has spent like a week campaigning in California to get her favorite mushroom elected as the state mushroom. Wow. And I was like, you nice. were born to play this That's, character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, and I feel like Part like Ryan obviously like is you know Sailor Neptune like that's like that's you know Lord Neptune right so I'm like okay water is fine but I also know that Ryan and I are just opposites so I feel like that always works well for us too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <gasps> like we are it's about awesome. as different of people as you can be <laughs> yep. it's also great when you're both creating characters to see yeah uh shall we shall we just for posterity shall we all perform our our uh, our <laughs> phrases once. <laughs> I mean, probably. Right. Nobody can see it, but it's important. It is. It's important to the game. What, I mean, right, we could you? technically cut this video clip and put it on there, too, if we all... We to. probably could. Yeah. But it's fine. <laughs> all right. Uh, we'll go... You know what? We're going to go right to left. We're going to start, Ryan, the and then just... just right. All right. Know, yeah. All right. Time to get into the deep end. It's very good. It's very good. <laughs> I bring the heat. Also oh, good. It was so good. <laughs> it felt You're good a, to do it. I had looked good. You're about to be dust in the wind. Blossom into beauty and power. Oh, it was so good. <laughs> All right. Our team is now transformed. Huzzah. I realize I've been muting myself on Zoom every time I cough. Uh, I was sick and I still have a bit of a cough. And then I'm like, oh, this does nothing for the Audacity file. I know <laughs> it bothers me because it's like my old microphone too had like a mute button on it. And this new one doesn't yeah. either. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I can't. But at least, the, I mean, the old microphone, when you muted it, it was a giant good chunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the blue Yeti. The infamous good chunk. I know. So it's like you, you had to edit it out anyway. So it's like, uh -huh. I might as well just like mute zoom and then eat and then, you know. Except my strawberries are like all juice now. So it's all just whipped cream juice. And we enjoyed our three minutes in the air conditioning. And there you go. Back. Um, I went with, uh, got a sneeze coming on one second. And it's gone. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And that that's it for our announcement. This uh, this uh, I'll try that. <laughs> I did it. Me too. Clicky. Yeah. Those waveforms. Wave forms. Wave forms. <laughs> Beautiful. The waveforms have been ghosts <laughs> this whole time. <laughs> Just tiny ghosts. Just tiny ghosts. <laughs> All right. I'm going to also take it. Get out of the garbage. Don't eat garbage. Thank you. Take a drink of this and then I'll. Time I most wish I, I was an artist is when someone says, like, the wave swarms were tiny ghosts the whole time. And then I have a ridiculous picture in my head. And I'm yes. like, if only I could communicate this uh, to the right. world. <laughs> And I feel that all the time, too. I'm like, uh -huh. I know exactly what this drawing would look like, but there's no way I can make a pencil do that. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. 
<laughs> All right. I am going to give a five count so we can get delicious background waveforms. And then we will start. What other questions did we have to answer, though? There was I, I'm trying to remember, like, what other things we were like, we'll define that. Yeah, there was one question that we were like, let's define that in, uh, in our fanfic. Yeah. I was trying to find it. I know. If only. If only we'd recorded <laughs> conversation. I know. I know. It's too bad. <laughs> It's too bad. But who has the time? Remember that one time you didn't do the countdown and I freaked out? I did the countdown, but I didn't do the clicky. Yeah. I think you were it like, was just, I, I, th- I was like, click, clack. Yeah, clicky, I don't know what clack, it was. Clack. And I was like, this is so <laughs> upsetting to me. I thrive on routine and consistency. Yeah. Yay. Ooh. Recording. to get into the deep end. I bring the heat. You're about to be dust in the wind. Blossom into beauty and power. 